prior panel. So I will turn it over immediately to the panel moderator, Don Johnson. Thanks. All right. Uh, yes, I want to say um, that we have nothing more to add because the last panel really did our work. Jeff was a Jeff Powell's absolutely right that that um, the last panel appropriately really was about what uh, is the role of of the lawyer advising the president in these kinds of circumstances. Uh, and uh, Bill was exactly right in saying that it's all going to come down to what kind of advice the OLC lawyer gives. And uh, Chris was brilliant in his placement and ordering of the panels. Um, the last one led, led perfectly into this. What I'd like to do is step back a bit at the beginning of this panel and, and um, move from where we just were, which is the most extreme hypothetical uh, where the OLC lawyer and the president are put in uh, an extremely challenging uh, position about how to abide by the rule of law and still save the nation, and, and back up a bit and talk about the role of OLC lawyers um, generally, and then get back into the, the, the role of OLC lawyers in the context of the um, war on terrorism. Now, everyone, I'm not going to go through and introduce the panel individually, but I'll just uh, say we all worked at the Office of Legal Counsel. And we also all have written about the responsibilities of uh, being an OLC lawyer and how one should go about advising the president generally, again, taking out it outside the context of the, law on the war on terror. And then we'll go back to whether that and, whether that makes a difference and how it makes a difference. So I'd like first to, um, to ask um, John McGinnis and, and Randy Moss have both uh, written articles specifically about um, models in which they des describe various kinds of models of OLC advice giving. And remember, this is advice to the president and uh, executive branch officers about how to go about um, their, their jobs, implementing their policies. It's everything from the day-to-day -day work of running the government to how to advance um, the most important initiatives of the administration and how to respond to congressional initiatives. So I think that it'd be useful to first ask John and then Randy to uh, just briefly describe the models they've developed for the, the possible ways of um, approaching that task of advising the president and the executive branch. I'm ask John to start. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, and I guess what now seems a lifetime ago in academics, uh, began by sort of very interested in OLC's uh, function. And I described three models of which I think uh, OLC can follow. And it, as I'll suggest, uh, they, they're somewhat blurred at the edges. And the OLC sometimes follows one or the other. But at least there are regulative ideas, ideals and ideas to keep in mind. There are three models I would call the court-centric model, the independent model, and the situational model. The court-centric model is what it uh, sounds like. It's where OLC operates uh, much as if it is trying to, to predict what the courts will do in fact. And that is what the law is. Uh, it is the most uh, reactive uh, a part of OLC's kind of jurisprudence. On the other hand, OLC can have very much an independent view of the law. It really doesn't, uh, the court's word is not the last word, not only on, on, on areas where the court has not set down a clear jurisprudence, but sometimes in cases where the court has set down a clear jurisprudence, the, court, the OLC will discontinue uh, to disagree. And that tradition comes in the Attorney General's opinions all the way back to Lincoln Levy, Jefferson's attorney general. It's not an accident that this comes in often in the administrations of presidents who have a distinctive jurisprudence. Jefferson, um, Jackson, Franklin Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan, who uh, actually have campaigned somewhat against the court. And it'd be a little strange if OLC simply accepted all the precedents, all, all the jurisprudence uh, for which the leader of the executive branch has uh, been, been uh, against. So, for instance, if, uh, if under Ronald Reagan, the OLC had accepted all of the um, uh, federalism uh, jurisprudence. And finally, I would describe a kind of situational model, a model in which the um, uh, OLC is not really so much concerned with either what the court says 
or what sort of the jurisprudential opinions of the administration are to fashion a different jurisprudence, but really just to get the president's policy uh, done, to do a slalom through whatever it needs uh, to do that. And I would say, I don't want to, uh, want to say that these models are not independent in the sense of almost every head of OLC has participated in every one kind of one of these models, and they're analytically not entirely distinct. The court-centric model can't be perfectly done. There are some instances where the court really doesn't have much precedent. It's ultimately going to be a lot of executive branch uh, molding. And moreover, there are other areas of the court where the court takes its position for institutional reasons that are peculiar to the judiciary. And so they're not, and they may have under-enforced constitutional norms for institutional reasons. If that's the case, there's no reason even to think it's uh, having a, 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 a uh, defying the court for the executive branch to have a different view. And finally, the executive, the independent view, I think, of having a elaborated jurisprudence dependent on your president is never pure either. The president doesn't have uh, a sufficiently elaborate uh, jurisprudence, uh, first of all, to decide a lot of these questions. And moreover, the policy imperatives are just very uh, powerful, uh, particularly on I issues where the president has a strong policy view. It's not only that they're imperative that you feel the pressure, but there are structural reasons in the executive branch the OLC is going to try to advance their policies despite the court's jurisprudence, or even the president, or even the, uh, some sort of jurisprudential ideals it has, and that's the reason that OLC exists in a market for legal advice to the president. There are com competitors to the president who offer legal advice, and if the OLC continues to say no, they'll find that it isn't often being asked for legal advice. Just one, one quick follow-up question to clarify, John. So these three models, uh, are they all, do you think, legitimate approaches for the Office of Legal Counsel to take? And I think you've made clear Certain, and I think we'd all agree that um, a court-centered model is, um, is uh, appropriate and permissible, and an independent model sometimes, as you said, is absolutely necessary um, because the, the court doesn't answer all questions and expects the executive to act independently in some areas. But your situational model, is that a legitimate model of OLC advice giving? Uh, I think it's I think it's I think it's legitimate. Uh, I think obviously it can be taken to an extreme where it might become illegitimate. But I don't think there's a, a legitimacy problem, at least in taking fairly aggressive readings of the law to advance the president's policy position, so long as they do have a bona fide uh, basis in law. I'm sort of less sympathetic of that. To that, I'm more sympathetic most to the the independent view if I were head of OLC, but I don't think it's an illegitimate model. And to be sure, I think in some sense, if you want to line up, do a regression analysis of OLC opinions, that might be the, the most predictive of, 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 uh, of the models for what OLC actually does. Randy. Well, uh, I, I hope not, because I think I, my, my view is, if I understand it right, is that I, th I think the situational model may be illegitimate, but I, wa I want to get to that in a second. I, I have two models, um, neither of which I think I, I strictly uh, uh, ascribe to and kind of view as caricatures for purposes of just understanding what the role is and, and kind of trying to dig into it a little bit. The first model is the lawyer's advocate, which I understand to be the, essentially the same thing uh, as John's situational model. Um, and maybe, maybe, maybe it's not, maybe that's why we disagree, but... As I understand this model, it's that the lawyer should make any reasonable argument uh, to support the client's um, interests. The president wants to uh, achieve some objective. Um, if you can kind of make a, a reasonable argument, you ought to make the reasonable argument to serve the interests of your client. And uh, as somebody who's in private practice, you know, I can say that that's something that lawyers in general do every day, um, although uh, hopefully not, I think, uh, in, in the government context. The, the other model is... Uh, what I refer to as the neutral expositor model, and that is a lawyer as a judge. And as caricatured, um, uh, that model you know, goes to the other extreme and takes absolutely no interest in what the policy objectives are of the administration or the president um, and simply uh, opines on the law in the abstract and, in fact, you know, almost takes offense at being told this is how we'd like to come out. And I, I don't think either of those are right. I think actually historically... Um, uh, and also as a matter of what uh, is correct, the neutral expositor model is closer 
um, uh, uh, to, to what should prevail. I, I think the difference where, where it goes wrong is in the notion of simply sitting back as a judge and not trying to achieve the goals of, of, of the president and the administration. But I think those goals should be achieved not through bending one's interpretation of the law and adopting an interpretation that is not the best view of the law, but being creative lawyers and coming up with alternative ways of achieving uh, the administration's goals in ways that are consistent with the best view of the law. Um, if it's okay, Don, I wanted just to say a little bit about the, new, the neutral expositor model and also mm -hmm. the kind of my basis for believing that the lawyer's advocate model is not really legitimate. If, if you go back to the just very earliest days in the country, um, uh, when uh, President Washington um, wrote to uh, Edmund Randolph uh, about being his attorney general, he said, I want a neutral expounder of the law rather than a political advisor. William Wirt, who is one of my favorite attorneys general, said, I do not consider myself as an advocate for the government, but as a judge called to decide a question of law with the impartiality and integrity which characterizes the judiciary. And I think it's worth stepping back for a second, because I think most people in the room, and, and certainly the premise of a lot of our conversation thus far today has been, yes, the president has an obligation to get it right, and the lawyers have an obligation to advise the president to get it right. But I think it's worth stepping back for a second and saying, well, why is that the case? From the perspective of the Attorney General, I think, first of all, there's an argument that the Attorney General actually has a statutory restriction, um, and that the Attorney General's role in providing legal advice is, is as a matter of statute, to provide the best view of the law. Uh, and I, I think you can, you can develop that argument based on the fact that the Attorney General's uh, advice-giving function dates back to the Judiciary Act of 1789. Uh, and the law is essentially unchanged today, which provides that the Attorney General shall provide opinions to the President and uh, the heads of the departments on questions of law. And I think the best understanding of what the word opinion means is, is what you really think rather than what you can argue. Um, in addition to that, I think that the use of the word Attorney General by the, uh, by the Congress actually was intended to draw in part on the British model where there was a notion of independence in providing legal advice. And finally, when the Justice Department itself was formed in 1870, one of the reasons that the Justice Department was formed was to take the advice-giving function out of the, uh, the agencies throughout government and the departments and bring them together in a single place, in part because there was a sense in Congress that there was too much agency capture. And that when lawyers were sitting down the hall from the Secretary of, of Agriculture and providing advice to the Secretary, it was too easy to give the advice the Secretary wanted. And if the advice was provided, from a central institution, you were more likely to get uh, balanced advice. I think there's also a prudential reason why OLC and, and the Attorney General wants to give the best view of the law, and that's, that's pretty straightforward, which is, is the, it's the entire currency of the Office of Legal Counsel. And you know, maybe you can fool people for a while, but in the long run, if you really are not providing what you think is the best view of the law and the institution thinks is the best view of the law, Congress and the public and, and, and folks in general will catch on to that. And the fact that you think something is lawful or opine that it is lawful will not have a great deal of meaning. And it won't provide a lot of comfort to the person you're providing the advice to, and there won't be a lot of reason for them to ask you that question because they know that when they get called up for some hearing on the Hill and screamed at for having come, taken some action, they say, well, but OLC I, told me I could do it. Someone's going to roll their eyes and say, of course OLC told you you could do it. Um, so th that's prudential. But I think most fundamentally, and, and this is where I get into the question of legitimacy, I think there's a constitutional basis why the Attorney General and the Office of Legal Counsel have to give the best view of the law. Um, I think it comes out of the Take Care Clause. Um, I think it comes out of the Oath Clause. Um, and I think most fundamentally, I think it comes out of the very kind of notion and structure of the Constitution of what it means um, to uh, be an officer in the government. Because when you're an officer in the government, you only have the power to act that the legislature or the Constitution has given to you. The President only has that power. And to advise the President, say, you know, I actually think the best view of the law is that um, uh, you're restricted from taking some action. But I think you can make a reasonable action, a reasonable argument for going beyond it. What you're really advising on the, under those circumstances is, my best view is, is that you should act outside the rules of government and the structure of, of the Constitution. And, and that strikes me as illegitimate. John, do you want to respond to that? Or should I go on to, Nina? You know, I'll give you a minute uh, to respond if you'd like. Uh, I don't. I don't think uh, we're in such uh, disagreement. Okay. I mean, I don't uh, think that uh, if you mean by situational to give a, a view that's a litigator's view of the law, I don't think that's the case. But at least when I found you know I'll see there are often cases there were a variety of views that seemed extremely uh, plausible, and I just think as a predictive matter, 
about how to describe OLC's opinions is that they, they often do shade to that. I certainly think everyone thinks they're giving uh, the best view of the law, and so in that sense, I'm sure they, everyone thinks they're following the oath clause or the take care clause, but as a sort of social scientist stepping back, I think it's often better to describe what is actually going on as a more of a situational model. So maybe for the difference between sort of an internal view, I agree the internal view of the actor has to be because of the take care clause and the oath clause, we're giving the best view. But I'm trying to step back and actually describe the way I think OLC and, and the Attorney General behaves. And I have to confess that I think uh, a sort of situational model does sometimes describe it as much as we up here internally, of course, would refuse to do that. So I really think the difference is a kind of internal versus a, a more sort of objective social scientist view than a disagreement about the obligations of the government lawyer. Um, Nina and Walter both worked elsewhere in the government as well. And so I want to invite your views on what is the appropriate role for an OLC lawyer, but also ask you to talk as well about um, Nina's experience was in the Solicitor General's office, and Walter was in the White House Counsel's office, and also add to this discussion. Um, and he was in the Solicitor General's office. Last and time the Solicitor General. General's <laughs> office, yeah. I mean, in addition to the Solicitor General's office, we have the White House Counsel here. Before um, bringing in the comparison with, with uh, the Solicitor General's office, I just wanted to, to um, parse John's analysis a, a little bit further and push yes. a little bit on what both John and Randy said. Um, I think that John is, is really, in some ways, combining two distinct strands. One is whether the Office of Legal Counsel, the executive as a whole, should follow a de departmentalist view <coughs> or a ju judicial supremacist view. And that is a, <coughs> you know, a, a, a choice which is going to alter the scope of um, when <coughs> the executive's own approach is going to matter. The executive's own approach is going to have a much broader berth if the executive indeed is not doesn't consider itself to be bound by judicial precedent. But even under a judicial supremacist view, as John correctly pointed out, there are a lot of areas in which the court defers. There are uh, areas of non-justiciability. And so there, under enforcement, there's a, in, under either view, there's the question, OK, what do you do in the gray areas? So I would s actually separate out the court-centered and the independent as having partly, de partly tracking judicial supremacy versus departmentalism. But then I think there's another, there's another question, which is, OK, assuming that you've settled on one of those two approaches, there, there is a substantial area of, of gray area. How, what approach do you take in that? What lens uh, should a lawyer use in approaching the gray area? Should the lawyer look at the client's immediate interest in this particular matter? which may be partly captured by John's situational view, should the client look at the president's jurisprudence more generally? And the contrast between those two positions somewhat tracks what was talked about in the last panel, the benefits of an ex ante versus an ex post set of commitments to a, a form of legal analysis. Um, and, and I think it, viewed through that, uh, that set of criteria, the, the adhering to the client's jurisprudence has a lot to commend it. Um, and, then, and then I think there's the last category of three would be the person's own personal best view of the law. And I guess I would say, well, ideally, the OLC lawyer would be neither using own best view nor using a very sort of narrowly client interest driven, but would be using this middle ground of the, of the president's jurisprudential vision. The problem is that we don't, often don't know uh, what the president's jurisprudential vision would require in a particular case. And so there, you're sort of left with a t sometimes a tension between own best view and one that's sort of more opportunistically uh, in the interests of, of the client's policy. And I think, I think they're very difficult issues. And I also want to pick up on a comment that John and Randy mentioned and bring in the SG's office. To me, one of the most striking differences between working in the Solicitor General's office and working in the Office of Legal Counsel was that uh, 
as John mentioned, OLC exists in a competitive market for legal advice, and the Solicitor General does not. The Solicitor General is the exclusive lawyer, and his, his lawyers in his office are the exclusive people within the government who can represent the United States and the Supreme Court. And they attain a functional autonomy as a result of that, functional, functional independence within the executive branch. Sure, the president can say, look, I want you to take such and such a position. But there's a, there's a sense that the Solicitor General can dig in his heels uh, more so, I think, than the head of OLC because of the lack of competition, the monopoly position. Um, and I think that raises some serious pressures for the Office of Legal Counsel when the lawyer is trying to decide, again, which lens to use. It creates pressures to use the narrowly client-centered lens because, hey, if I keep telling these guys no, they can just go around me. And I think that's just a very serious structural concern um, for OLC. And I think there's a number of ways that one can uh, minimize that, address that, but because I don't want to monopolize time. I'll come back. I, yeah, I've, yeah, I've got some points of real disagreement. Um, Nina, I think, though, you, you may reflect the, the accepted view of OLC in the SG's office. I think this is best understood by thinking about the fact that in my view, there's a subtle but significant difference in how one looks at legal questions. The same person, I've had some of these jobs, I've thought about some of the other, I've turned down at least one of the other jobs, I've imagined some of the other jobs, between being White House counsel, head of OLC, a federal judge, solicitor general, or personal best view as a professor, okay? And I think the same question can, and indeed, in my view, should look different from those different perspectives. I think the White House counsel is legitimately an advocate for the president. I think the White House counsel is there if the president is not a lawyer or not a highly trained lawyer, few of them will be. Uh, the White House counsel is there to, to do the job that Randy does and that I do in our practice, which is to advocate a client's viewpoint, and that seems appropriate to me. Um, and to argue to OLC the president's viewpoint, and to try to slalom through arguments and to say, but have you thought about this, have you thought about that? Have you thought about deferring to the court? Have you thought about taking an independent view of the court? <laughs> Whatever. You, that's what the White House counsel does. OLC, I think, is, is to be much more independent and removed from that and making you know, a different kind of best judgment view. I don't think that the head of OLC, I would view the question the same as head of OLC as I did were I a federal district judge in the District of Columbia. Now, I'm, I think I'm closer to the model of a federal district judge, but not all the way there by any means because I think it's perfectly appropriate to say at OLC, as I said on more than one occasion, tie goes to the president. That's not an appropriate position to take if you're a federal judge. You have to find some other way of resolving you know, the, the uncertain question other than tie goes to the president. So that's it. Um, I think a president should get his legal advice from the Department of Justice. I think um, the White House Counsel's Office should almost be abolished. One lawyer to give this kind of advice to the president and one younger lawyer to do contracts for the people that tend the Rose Garden. Uh, I know that, <laughs> former one. And an esteemed deputy to do judicial nominations. I, I think it's better for president to get his legal advice from the Department of Justice because it is seven blocks away from the White House and because you're situated in a group of professional lawyers because 90% of the lawyers at the Department of Justice, considering all the U.S. attorneys, do not turn over with administrations because you can, as a, as a lawyer at OLC, as head of OLC, rely upon career lawyers who came in under different administrations. You're much more likely to get it right than when you're in the White House Counsel's Office next door to the First Lady or across the hall from the Vice President, depending in different administrations who's the most influential person putting pressure on you. You go to coffee in the White House, you're surrounded by people with the latest nine minutes old tracking polls. Um, 
you know, you go to the Justice Department, the morning I walked from the White House to the Justice Department, put the hand on the wall, and I felt like I was home, home base. Okay, those are very different roles. OLC and the SG is just the one point I want to make. There is this sense that there's a special independence um, in the Solicitor General, more independent than OLC. I think that's exactly, should be, you may be correct in the script, should be exactly backwards. The head of OLC needs much more independence from the administration than is appropriate for the Solicitor General because the Solicitor General is an advocate. And presidents run on platforms uh, of what they want to accomplish. Um, I also disagree with what several people have said, that there is a competitive market for legal advice out there. They, oh, the, the, as long as the, the regulation is out there that says that the, the Office of Legal Counsel's opinions are binding, I think they are. You're situated in the Department of Justice. You speak with the imprimatur of the Attorney General of the United States, who is the only person who has the authority to bind U.S. attorneys. If you're willing to exercise the authority at OLC, you have it on matters large and small. One quick example or two. A meeting with the Deputy Attorney General, giving our view of a memorandum in progress that would limit the Deputy Attorney General's authority to order certain kinds of extraordinary renditions during certain, during certain kinds of extraordinary ways. The Deputy Attorney General did not agree with the analysis. We're walking back to OLC. The young lawyer says, well, we're going to get rolled on this one. Why do I even finish the memo? I said, oh, no. We're going to finish the memo just the way we have it. But, you know, but the two senior officers of the Justice Department dis are going to disagree with you. I said, that's too bad. What are they going to do? The Deputy Attorney General is the action officer. The OLC opinion that what she's doing is lawful is essential to her as the action officer. She can't order up the legal opinion, get one that says it's unlawful from OLC, order it reversed, and then act on the basis of the new memorandum and have any authority at all. And then there was telling basically the head of OMB when we disagreed on the, what was lawful to do with a, with a large check that came in that they wanted to keep within the administration instead of depositing in the Treasury. And we did, argued and argued and argued, and finally I was told we just have to agree to disagree. Our lawyers think so and so. I said, that's fine. I've given you my legal opinion. The only lawful thing to do with this is deposit it to the Treasury. You've got the check. You can do whatever the hell you want to with it. We can just, all of a sudden, the person on the other end of the line realizes that this is checkmate. They're going to take a check and where the OLC has said the only lawful thing is deposit it to the Treasury and do something else with it. <laughs> right, that's great. So I, I actually disagree that there is... Um, there are, are people who now who have gone and gotten opinions from other parts of the government, but I think they're on, you know, on, on very shaky ground. Just a word. The Solicitor General, on the other hand, is often an advocate. If the President Reagan ran with a view that the courts had run amok on cases like Roe versus Wade, and it seemed to me that courts were appointed for life tenure, and it's perfectly appropriate for the Solicitor General to make a professional, respectable argument that those cases ought to be reconsidered. And for Clinton to make a different view. That's the... Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with you about the importance of the independence of the Office of Legal Counsel, but I do think there's a risk, and, and that when the Office of Legal Counsel speaks, that that is by statute the, and regulation and custom the definitive view, but the risk is that you, the hard questions are not brought to you, that you're gone around and that people seek legal advice elsewhere. I mean, we had an insane situation where I think once... One of the agencies had actually hired private counsel and had posted advice on the Establishment Clause on their website uh, saying, you know, we got this advice and this is how we're operating. And I mean, it was shocking to us. And I think that wasn't really self-consciously done. But, you know, there are other sources within the government more, more germanely. People can be happy with their own agency counsel, uh, <coughs> with their own department or division. And I think Randy's right that one of the incentives though, to go to OLC is the CYA. I mean, and, and that it's only as good as the reputation of OLC for, you know, really professional and, and somewhat detached legal advice. But that, not every situation presents that incentive. 
And so I'm just saying that there, there's a tremendous need for an arm's length. And I think you know, this, these memos show that the importance of that. But I, and I and you think it's, it is greater than, than the Solicitor General's in part because the court is backstopping what the SG does. But I think there are, as a pragmatic and institutional matter, real challenges to achieving that kind of space in which to be um, you know, giving a serious legal check on executive conduct. I just think it's a, it's a challenging thing. And I think the stature of the person is one of the factors that contributes to whether that works well. I think it's hugely important. And I think that um, I think it's, it's, it, the incentive structure is so different in the political parts of, of an administration that what happens is if you don't have a head of OLC at the beginning of an administration, if there's a period of drift, you're, in, you're at very great risk if that power vacuum will be filled by the White House Counsel's Office and other administrations and some administrations by the Vice President's Office. And I think that is uh, extremely risky. You get bad legal advice. I try to use examples of bad advice from my administration and good advice from other administrations for credibility. But OLC and Republican presidents has stood up to the president. It was OLC under President Bush, with the, the uh, number 41, when there was enormous pressure on him to, to decree that capital gains could be indexed by his order to the Treasury Department for inflation and uh, to declare an inherent line item veto authority. And OLC wrote very tough memos in both of those cases saying absolutely not under enormous hydraulic pressure. That was in administrations of other parties than mine, and I've seen it done. And I've seen us make mistakes in the White House in having an opinion in the White House when we did not have an attorney general confirmed. The White House made its own decision about whether the First Lady's Health Care Task Force had to comply with the open meetings provisions of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and concluded that the answer was no, under enormous pressure, you know, for all the good reasons, not to bring the lobbyists in, et cetera, to do it in private. They concluded the answer was no. I agonized over whether I would have made that bad decision had I been given that responsibility in the White House. And I don't know whether I could have stood. But I know at OLC I wouldn't have gotten it wrong. I would have talked to the career people at OLC that many of you all know. They would have told me, that you have no chance of winning this in the D.C. Circuit. If you get before Judge Lambert, you know, people could go to prison. <laughs> this is such a bad idea. <laughs> I would have, you know, told the White House, absolutely no. You, you may not evade the, the federal, you know. I know would have gotten it right and situated at OLC, and that's why I think it's a better, okay. uh, a better place to do legal advice. Well, I, I think I disagree with you somewhat about the, uh, the, mar the way the marketplace operates. And I think there are some questions that are of sufficient magnitude and the, the most important ones that are always going to come to OLC simply because it would be glaring for it not to come to OLC. And I think it's right that there are certain questions that are generated in the, in the White House where they really um, would be acting quite foolishly not to go to OL, OLC. But there are many, many decisions that are made at the agency general counsel level all the time. And certainly it was my experience that there were some general counsels that came to us quite frequently for advice. And there were others who very rarely came to us for advice. And I know that the ones who very rarely came to us for advice made a conscious decision that they wanted to reserve for themselves the authority. And I mean, it's sort of, it's, it's human nature. They say, look, you know, I have a choice. If I can, make, I can make the decision on this, and I can do what I think is right for my agency here, or I can kick it over to OLC to do so. And I think the different agencies had, had very different approaches to that. And I think one of the things with the White House is that you need not only a relationship with the White House where they realize, boy, I'd be stupid not to present my question to OLC for resolution, but also where you have the White House out there saying, our policy folks here at HHS is thinking about doing something, and the general counsel of HHS has signed off on that. That sounds sort of questionable to us. We better tell HHS to call OLC and get OLC involved in this, and that happened frequently as well. Uh, I would say also that uh, it is in, the is in the president's institutional interest, so I don't think there's always a conflict here to have some objective advice that may even prevent him from doing things or some people around him, of course the president is often not focused on things, that will get him into greater trouble. It's a kind of Ulysses on the mast function 
that OLC performs Ooh. to some extent. And I would say that the, the line item veto opinion was an excellent example of that. That was really not very hard mm-hmm. as a legal matter. It's mm-hmm. certainly true that some um, uh, lawyer who, who would want to give up his reputation or some sort of politi- very politically oriented person may have come down the other way. And it was very important to have someone like the OLC who could take some of the slings and political arrows really on behalf of the president here because that's his long-term institutional interest. But then, if that's the case, we, it's really not such a complete disjunction between uh, the president's interest and what OLC is doing. And also, I don't think necessarily means that OLC won't operate a little differently in an issue which isn't uh, as legally powerful or as more, as more legally ambiguous as, uh, as uh, than the situation of the line item veto. The White House counsel and Bill Marshall uh, was fabulous to work with when he was deputy White House counsel. The White House counsel is the one that's got to be the enforcer of getting issues to, um, to OLC. They've got to hear, the White House counsel got to hear from the cabinet secretary, whoever the relevant person is, domestic policy advisor, et cetera, that there is this issue percolating that the department of so-and-so is going to undertake this initiative. Their lawyers have signed off on it. The White House counsel is going to say, have they talked to OLC before the president approves this? If it gets up to that level, I mean, that's exactly what happened with the FDA's assertion of jurisdiction over tobacco, Chris. It was handled within HHS. It got to the White House. In that case, the president said, I want to know what OLC thinks. Because I don't want to do this if we're going to get enjoined in the federal district court before we ever get started. Uh, and that's, how it, that, that, that's where it gets kicked over to us. Um, I was afraid we wouldn't have any disagreement on this panel. Uh, and here as a moderator, I feel um, like I need to jump in because, I, and, and I didn't expect to disagree with Nina um, at all. I was prepared to disagree with John because when I read your article, um, I read the description of the situational lawyer model a little differently um, as uh, arguing that it, it would actually be a legitimate um, choice for an administration to, to use a model, and here's a quote, in which uh, the attorney general would write opinions in the situational interest of his client without any obligation to preserve legal principles, whether autonomous or court-centered. And I think, um, as a, you know, I think it's important for us to separate out. Are we talking about um, uh, uh, descriptively or normatively? Um, and to kind of nail down a little more before we move on to assessing the torture memo, whether it is ever appropriate for OLC lawyers in giving advice to um, slant the advice toward the um, situational um, desires of the president in ways that do not demonstrate any obligation to preserve legal principles, whether autonomous or court-centered, which seems to me clearly um, inappropriate and violative of the, the uh, constitutional obligations that, that uh, Randy described. I also um, think it would be completely inappropriate for OLC to ever slanted its advice because of concern about the market for legal advice. And I'm not suggesting, Nina, um, that you're saying that the advice should be so slanted. But I also never felt that pressure at all at OLC. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe I was just oblivious, but uh, I felt that that, um, on at least important legal matters, OLC consistently was asked for advice by the White House. Um, the Attorney General, you know, met with the, we met, met with the Attorney General twice a day, so we knew what was going on, at least uh, throughout the Justice Department, and um, that gave you a window into what was going on throughout the executive branch as well. Um, and there were certainly times when the Deputy Attorney General or uh, Deputy White House Counsel wanted to have an unpleasant, you know, two-hour meeting where you, or the OMB, uh, mm-hmm. Some from OMB, where you had to spend two hours explaining um, your legal reasoning. But uh, I really never felt that we were under pressure to um, change our advice, except in a few instances where it was appropriate, where there were a couple instances where we were told, 
you know, President Clinton has a view on this constitutional question. You know, the FDA regs, Walter mentioned, you know, President Clinton has a view on commercial speech. Uh, and there you get into the independent model of advice giving. And you're, I think you're out of the situational model. Well, can I just say one, one thing about that? I, I think that the, one of the reasons that people come to OLC for the advice, uh, notwithstanding the marketplace, and notwithstanding the fact that OLC typically gives their best view of the law, is because OLC doesn't just simply give up at that point. OLC doesn't simply say, you know, we've received your request for an answer. You're, um, you want to do X. The answer is no, you can't do it. Um, because people will, I think, stop calling if you do that. And what you do instead is you say, we understand what you want to do. We don't think you can do it that way. Here are some other ideas of how you might want to achieve it. If you made this change, we think it would work. And people actually then value what you're providing them, and they come back Mm -hmm. For more, and there are, obviously, are, are lots of reasons that people come back for covering their ass. Sometimes they want you to tell you things that they know they know the answer to, but they want you to say it to take responsibility for it. Um, you know, there are a range of, of, of reasons people come to OLC mm -hmm. for the advice, but I think that um, one of the important reasons is is because the OLC lawyers go beyond being simply judges and look for solutions. Right. That's why it's actually a more fun job than being solicitor general because it's transactional. You know, you're, you're not stuck with history of the story. You can change the facts uh, in order to get there. Um, you're not just cleaning up messes already made. <laughs> you're sometimes. Averting, right. you're sometimes right. averting messes rather than cleaning up after, which is inherently very much more satisfying. Yeah. Now, um, before we move on, I do want to move on to the, the specific title of this panel is uh, the role of lawyers in the war on terrorism. But... Before we move on to that second half of the panel, I want to open it up to comments yeah. on uh, this, this more general discussion. Yes. I think so far the discussion has been terrific. But one thing I haven't heard as another variable is it strikes me that from the clients, um, there's the question whether they'll keep coming to ask for advice. And people have talked about that. I think Randy's quite right that one of the special things about OLC is that no is not usually the end. And so that certainly increases the likelihood of um, people coming back even when the first part of the answer is unhappy. But another variable there, it seems to me, is in what form the request for advice is made, right? Like, um, surely there are tactical decisions involved um, in whether the client set calls up and says, can you give us you know, oral advice tomorrow on this? Or can you give us a written opinion? Um, and even, because yes isn't the same in both places, right? Like one of them is going to have, you know, written down reasons for yes that may have implications later on too. And so I just wonder um, what people think about that as a variable in, um, in, in the way, well, yeah, how variations in the way OLC gets asked for, it, for its advice affects both OLC um, and the nature of OLC law. Can I just build on that and say what also about the when the lawyer when the uh, client asks the question, uh, not what's your best view, but tell me whether there's a colorable argument here. You know, okay. if if the question comes that way, do you just answer it that way? Do you make an independent judgment about whether you think it's appropriate to answer it that way? Or? Who wants to go first? <laughs> Well, uh, I think you have to be very careful about how you accept questions. And um, to resist the pressure to give a quick answer. And I pretty strongly held the line that we would not give an answer until we were really comfortable. Sometimes we say there are more cases we need to look at. We need to think of this a lot more. You may remember the occasion I broke that rule under extraordinary pressure that Mikva wanted our preliminary assessment, that they had to have it. And I said, we're not ready, but I'll send a memo over anyway. The one time I broke this rule, we then went over to the media. I don't know who was with me, but some of you all were. And I think I was pretty exhausted at the moment. Mikva said, we don't think this is your best work. And I went berserk. Remember that? I was in area. And I had to send flowers to the White House. Remember that whole thing? I went, and nobody had ever expected me to go. I went, the only time I think that only one or two times in four years I lost my temper. But it was because I had broken my own rule, which is just to say we're not going to answer that question in the time frame you're asking it because it cannot be answered you know, in a professional, responsible way. And we were pretty good about that. 
Mm -hmm. the, the one thing I would add on that, though, I mean, it's sort of a little bit of a transition to the national security area, where at times you actually don't have that luxury. Oh, right. I, I can think of one occasion when Nina, I think, was, was sitting in my office, and we were having a, a, a meeting of the deputies in the office, and we got a telephone call from Jimmy Baker, who was the uh, counsel to the national security advisor. And he said, you have 10 minutes to answer the following question. And he gave us the question. It was a life or death question um, dealing with very serious criminal statutes. We talked about it. Thank God Dan Kofsky was there and told me the right thing to do. <laughs> Call, I called the attorney general up, and I called her out of a meeting. You know, now we're down to you know, four minutes left. I called her out of a meeting. I said, got the call from the White House. Um, they've asked the following question. This is the advice that I'm prepared to give. She said, that's fine. You ought to give that advice. Hung up the telephone. Telephone rang. It was, it was Beth Nolan and Jimmy Baker calling back. We need the advice. I gave the answer. As I'm giving the answer, the other telephone rings. Is the attorney general calling back because she wants to discuss it some more? I say, too late. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, it's, it's very important to, uh, I agree, to have the exactly right question. I think it's also important for OLC not to give answers to, is this a colorable legal right. argument? That's right. not OLC's uh, uh, function. Uh, it's also very important for OLC to negotiate, and, and this may be a segue into some of the uh, discussions of some of the memos, to negotiate very specific questions to answer and often not give very abstract, well, it's almost like a court, not to give abstract uh, 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 advice, but to give advice to very concrete uh, questions. And that often has to be a matter of negotiation between the head of OLC and the, um, the person asking for the advice. So how you frame the advice is almost, is, is, it really is, I think, as important as anything else OLC does, uh, even as important as what it writes in the opinion, because I think that has huge implications. And it may be that as much of, as anything, one of the problems with one of the, 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 the so-called torture memo is that the memo is not correctly framed. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, just two quick observations for you on the general nature. One is that I think it is useful to have someone in OLC in whom the administration has political confidence. Actually, I think um, that is actually more useful in, in maintaining the independence than people would think. Um, and I know, to give you an example in the SG's office, uh, the, our own graduate, Michael Dreeben, who's the principal criminal deputy, said that one of the great things about having Ted as Solicitor General was in the criminal law area where the government had to say, we can't defend a certain criminal prosecution and the political people are really upset about that. The fact that it was Ted Olson, nobody could second guess him in this administration. Uh, his, you know, his answer was, you know, was, was final. So rather than being a sort of political guy for him, he had that, that authority. And, and secondly, I think you have to tell yourself when you take one of those jobs that they'll respect you more in the morning when you tell them no. It, it, it's, it's true in much of life, and it, and, it, and it really works out. You have to be willing to tell them no. It's even better if you enjoy telling them no. <laughs> what can they do to you, you know? It's, uh, you have to be willing to say no, and over time, very quickly, you gain respect by that. The last point is, if you look back historically, presidents who think they are served by getting the legal advice they want are almost always wrong. I mean, the health care task force legal entanglement was a disaster. The worst thing that happened in that area was getting the legal advice they wanted rather than the right legal advice. And indeed, that's true of the torture memos as a segue, that it is been very wounding for this administration and thought they were assisting the war on terror and assisting the goals of the administration to do these memos, which they, I think one would say clearly they did not. And to place more limits on this would have been, in fact, beneficial. Presidents don't know that, and it takes them a while to you know, begin to respect the fact that they've, they've, they've got good legal advice. Yeah. Great segue, both John and Walter, into uh, the uh, role of lawyers in the war on terror. And I do want to start with the uh, memo OLC wrote on permissible interrogation techniques and the, the meaning of torture. And, and then also just open it up to other thoughts about how the administration and OLC lawyers are doing, to the extent we know what they're doing, in advising uh, President Bush on, on uh, how to fight the war on terror, the legal constraints. But I want to introduce it just in case we don't have the full range of views on the OLC 
interrogation memo here on, on this uh, panel, I thought I'd just read two very short quotes, very different views on, on that memo. So we have um, Anthony Lewis wrote an op-ed that some of you may have seen, in which he says, the memo reads like the advice of a mob lawyer to a mafia don on how to skirt the law and stay out of prison. Avoiding prosecution is literally a theme of the memoranda. So that's at one extreme. And then we have John Yu in an op-ed writing, uh, OLC was just doing its job. By exploring the boundaries of what is lawful, the administration's analyses identified how a decision maker could act in an extraordinary situation. For example, suppose that the United States captures a high-level al-Qaeda leader who knows the location of a nuclear weapon in an American city. So with those two different, very different interpretations of le the legitimacy, and, and we should focus on the legitimacy of how OLC answered the questions as opposed to the merits, because we had panels already on the, the um, substantive questions of the extent of the president's um, uh, powers and on um, uh, the, the legal standards governing interrogation. So let's really just focus on, um, did OLC handle this correctly? Is the memo within the legitimate models of OLC lawyering? And, and also, we've all been at OLC. I'm interested in having people think about uh, what would you have done if you were the head of OLC and you were asked this question by the White House Counsel? Um, why don't I start with um, Nina? Mm -hmm. Any part of that? Um, I guess one of the things that, that, that strikes me is the, is the context in which these memos arose. And, and I guess I would point out two things about them. I mean, there, there's this uh, Seymour Hirsch article in the, in the New Yorker from May, uh, where in talking about the abuse at Abu Ghraib and how it came about, he gives us background um, that back in, in the previous fall, uh, that there that was tracking of, a, of an automobile convoy that American intelligence believed contained Mullah Muhammad Omar, the Taliban leader, and a lawyer on duty at the United States Central Command headquarters in Tampa, Florida, refused to authorize a strike. By the time an attack was approved, the target was out of reach. And that, then he goes on and says, this occurred again and again, and Rumsfeld was apoplectic, and that there was this sense that we were being unduly legalistic and that we had to be willing to take risks. And you know, we're in a war for our very existence of our, of our national way of life. We have to be willing to take risks. And he paints that as part of the backdrop to a much more aggressive approach to the law, where there's a request made to OLC, how far can we go? It's made, as John points out, at a very high level of generality. Um, and I, I think that that raises the same dilemma that we talked about in the last panel um, about the commander-in-chief power. We can see benefits to uh, actions taken in advance, to adherence to principles that are pre-existing, that the military had been operating under, which prohibit a lot of what the OLC memo later invites, um, because it's free from the pressures of the moment that may bias and distort uh, judgment. On the other hand, we can also see that when, the, when decisions are made in a particular context with a particular set of exigencies before us, that may inform the discussion. That may make it more pointed and more aware. Um, and I think you have that issue in terms of temporality, whether, it's, whether that's a reason to stick with the tried and true um, Department of Defense approach to these things or break from it. And it also comes up in whether it's better to deal with the question at a higher level of generality or in terms of a more concrete uh, set of circumstances. And I think it's not entirely clear. The big flaw, in my view, the obvious, more obvious flaw, is the apparent failure to uh, confer with people in the criminal division, with people in the Department of State, uh, and to get some sense from them institutionally about what this was going to mean for established executive branch uh, procedures and understandings of law in these areas. And it just, it doesn't even appear to take account of those, let alone 
self-consciously make a, a considered decision to stray from them. And it just, it, it seems very problematic for the interests of the executive um, that, 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 that there was that neglect of, of the institutional expertise and the legal expertise in the government. John? Oh, uh, well, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, I know we're not looking at the substance of most of the memos, to look at the process, since I don't really know exactly about the process and the circumstances, and so I'd rather speak. I don't want to constrain you, so I don't say speak, whatever I don't want to speak uh, like to, uh, to see if I, I would see critiquing this memo in general, but let me, let me say some things that I, in my experience at OLC, I think sometimes were not sufficiently taken into account and could get one into the kind of trouble that it may appear that this memo has gotten the administration into. And one is the beginning of to frame a question very clearly and narrowly, the, the, the kinds of interrogation uh, procedures, uh, the circumstances, uh, uh, certainly if the circumstance is uh, someone who is uh, uh, about to set off a bomb in New York Harbor, I think that would be a very different kind of circumstance which strike people very differently. And I think that segues to my next point, which is that you have to expect that these memos, even if they are not uh, released voluntarily, may end up on the front page of the Washington Post or the New York Times. And they have to be written uh, with that in mind. And that may seem a very pragmatic uh, uh, view. Uh, but I think it's something that OLC can never forget, and I think ultimately improves the product because it makes the product. It makes you think of well, what are we, what 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 are the possible criticisms that are going to be made of it? And it's hard for me to believe uh, that this memo that I ever thought that this memo would see the light of day. And I just think that in in official Washington is simply a mistake. Uh, not a uh, you just have to expect that that's going. Uh, to happen and sometimes I've actually thought that it's very important actually to have people go over who haven't written the memo but an important memo like this and to see how this would these this kind of information will strike other people and will strike uh, people who have not been uh, deeply immersed in it because I think that is there's a there is frankly a public relations failing with this memo and then finally I think one other question, thing that this could be come out of, is something that's happened to OLC over the years, I think, which has been that uh, most lawyers now at OLC are from the political party of the president. That was not always true. Uh, and I think the difficulty with that is you don't necessarily have enough diversity of opinion. And this has happened now under both Democratic and Republican administrations. And that doesn't mean a memo will change 180 degrees if you have in-house critics, but it may change 40 or 50 degrees, and that's very important. Even the CIA has Team A and Team B uh, going over matters that are, I think, as important uh, as, the, uh, uh, as the torture memo. And so those are the kinds of things that I feel are, are, that I worry about more institutionally for OLC rather than about this memo in particular. And I think that's as important, having in-house critics, as getting information as important as that is from the rest of the executive branch. Because one problem OLC always faces in listening to the rest of the executive branch is they have their vested institutional interest, the criminal division, the people in uh, DOD. Uh, they're, they, they're always speaking from a very institutionally interested manner. And you're, that's not... OLC's role, and it's sometimes by give, deferring too much to them, they actually you can abnegate OLC's role, which is to rise above that kind of institutional interest. So my concern is less to get more uh, perspectives from everyone else, so that could, can be important, but to create more tension within OLC itself, uh, which I think has somewhat subsided because of the personnel decisions in the last 20 years. Yeah. Did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I really agree with John about um, the acting as if the memo is going to be public. I mean, it's sort of the, the thought experiment of, in, in the absence of the attainability of transparency, let's try to do a thought experiment about transparency. But I disagree somewhat that the Team A, Team B internal approach is better than um, reaching out to different components within the Department of Justice. I think one of the thing, one of the times when the Office of Legal Counsel renders the best decisions, are in those instances when it so happens 
that there are different entities within the executive that can speak with a level of legal sophistication and groundedness about issues. They have implementing authority, they have enforcement authority, they have you know, military operational authority, what have you, with respect to an issue. And if there are, if there are divergent um, such experts within the executive branch, you get a wealth of understanding about the issues that you cannot get from just the relatively inexperienced, super smart legal analysts sitting in the office of legal, legal counsel. So I actually think both have their role, but I, I wish it were as easy that you could have team A and team B. You represent the civil liberties perspective, and you represent the you know, military uh, national security uh, perspective. Let's have at it. I think you, you miss some of the issues that people who really are steeped in uh, the way these legal issues play out understand. So I think you, you can't abdicate to them, but I think that there's one of the very problems that we have in non-judicially reviewed executive branch legal decisions is that we often lack that other voice uh, because it just doesn't, it isn't there in the executive branch. And interestingly, you see a lot of the suggestions coming out of the, nine, the various 9-11 uh, commissions from uh, Governor Keynes to uh, um, uh, you know, th these various commissions saying we should have a civil liberties ombudsperson within the executive. We, could ha we should have a civil liberties review board within the executive. There's a sense of wanting to, to create an institutionally sophisticated and grounded voice within the executive that can perhaps, as a, as a um, happy side effect, provide that kind of insight uh, to an OLC. Randy? I just wanted to add that I think that there's a, a overlay of national security here uh, as well, and that the sort of perils um, that are presented here are, are, are you particularly high, at least in the national security setting. And at least in my experience, I, I think that there are few jobs that a lawyer can undertake that are as difficult as providing advice on significant national security matters. Because there's just not, there's not room, or there's not margin for error. You can't, mm -hmm. you know, have a cautionary no. Um, you don't want to say yes when yes isn't, isn't the right answer. Um, you know, lives can be at stake based on your advice. And you really feel it, and I'm confident that the authors of this memorandum really felt that what they were doing could well affect um, uh, lives of, of, of potential future uh, victims of terrorist attack. And you feel the weight of that um, that is the na in, in the national security setting. You can't often discuss it, broadly at least, because of uh, classification issues, you lack the sort of input and balance you're getting um, from either public debate on the issues where you're able to kind of read what other people think about the issue or even discussing it broadly, even within OLC. Um, so you, there's, there's, you can't have a cautionary yes or a cautionary no. You feel like you have to really get the answer right. Um, and you feel these pressures. And I think that one of the real big mistakes here um, was in, in either OLC offering or agreeing to answer questions like this in the abstract, because it plays into kind of precisely the sorts of concerns I have, where you say to yourself, "My God, I don't want to be the guy that's tying the hands of uh, the administration." If it turns out, and, you know, and then we start doing the hypotheticals that we were doing earlier today, you know, we, we, it turns out we know the guy who's got the bomb that's set to go off. It's Jack Bauer. Can we torture him? And you start doing these hypotheticals that may never come up in life. And if you write a very broad opinion like this in the abstract, dealing with national security issues, there's a real danger of trying to kind of leave all the doors open because you don't know what's going to come up. And there really could be some hypothetical in the future where you might really want to come out differently. And I think it's particularly important in this context um, to come down and say, look, you know, tell me what you want to do here. And let's look at what you want to do. And I'll opine on, on what you want to do rather than kind of providing a general memorandum uh, that in the end comes off reading like there aren't any limits. Walter. Let me say, I think this is a, a truly terrible me memorandum, and, and, and it, it, for no other reason than without going through it, and I want to think about why that happened. It's, it's reasoning at places is just horrendously bad. Um, and let me say a word for those who were involved in it, though. Let's remember, this is dated... Um, August 1, it's, that's 11 months after 9-11. Uh, 
Um, just, just remember the context in which people are acting. If you had asked, and that's what it's finally written, it's being worked on during the first 11 months after that. If you had asked people, what do you really think between now and, say, September of 2004, in the next three years, what are your expectations about further truly catastrophic terrorist attacks? Most people would have thought, well, they're virtually certain. They're virtually certain. This was the first wave. They're coming. So it's, it's, it's a little bit too easy not to take yourself out of the circumstances in which they are in. That, and, and, and maybe we're wrong now in, in, in the fact that we've been more, we can be more sanguine about this psychologically than they, they would have been. The next attack is coming. We didn't know about this one. What's, you know, what's next? And to think, remember how almost the purest luck meant that there's still a White House and a Capitol uh, standing. So that um, uh, I, I just want to note the, the context. What goes wrong, I think, is without having debating teams within the government, Nina, I think that it just shows the importance of responding to John's concern about the single political party, the importance of keeping career people at OLC. I mean, I certainly urged people to stay on when I came in, and we largely succeeded. Some of them then stayed on in future, the Dan Kofskis and Paul Coburns. And I actually tried to have a position that we didn't take any really, didn't come up with any really sensitive opinion that did not involve career people. I just think you have to have people who are not all caught up in the program of the, of the administration. You want somebody looking at the health care issue who does not, who is skeptical about the whole idea of the, the direction of the First Lady's Health Care Task Force, just to, so they're not beclouded by the desire that they hope to goodness this is you know, all, you know, all, all valid, at least to get that, get that perspective in. And I found it invaluable on one issue where I thought, we actually, if we lost in any circuit, it was going to be a disaster. In any circuit, we'd have a whole bunch of cases overturned. Could we do X? I went to Todd Gonciano, who clerked for Edith Jones, and said, would Judge Jones, I want you to read this memo and see if Judge Jones would buy this argument. He said she would never buy this argument when he came back. And it's invaluable to have that, you know, have that, uh, have that perspective. Um, you can't do good you can't, can't do good law that way. And um, I do think it's something that we should, we should try to over, overcome. But I got um, advice from predecessors, from Olson and Flanagan and Barr and uh, Cooper. And, but mainly, uh, I had the advantage of having been a career lawyer at the Department of Justice for a year. And maybe the only assistant attorney general who had been. And so knew that, you know, you you ask some of the long-time career people what they think of these issues. Uh, and that's a protection. I think when you get involvement from the White House and when you get an inner group within OLC, uh, when you don't have a strong head of OLC, you have a combustible combination. I don't know if any of those pertain at any particular time, but those are the risks to be avoided. Uh, answers driven by outside of the Justice Department and too tightly held within OLC, um, and not and not ventilated enough, not not put within the internal debate. We had a two deputy rule, which uh, I think may be reinstalled. We always had a second deputy look at a memorandum before it went out and raise questions about it, uh, and that I think uh, was essential. And there are things like that that I have the sense. There was some breakdown in the kind of best processes that you would have. And perhaps understandable that you would want a quick and, and very inside process, but, but it shows, I think, the unwisdom of it. Mm -hmm. Let's go to uh, the audience here. Stuart? Um, I'm very sympathetic with the empirical claim that it is in the President's best interest to have an OLC that has this kind of balance because it actually avoids the the, the problem that we otherwise might have would it, that, in fact, you, the best zealous advocate, the best, the best person who, who would be an OLC head is, who's a zealous advocate would, in fact, want to get these considered views of a variety of different people, so the problem goes away. I think that empirically is probably right, but I, but I, 
But I could be wrong. Um, and if I'm wrong, then the problem gets sharper. And the reason it's not so sharp in the Solicitor General's office, of course, is because you have a, you have, you're already in litigation posture. You have a court there to oversee you. And the whole point of OLC, I always thought our motto when we were there was, if we've done our job right, no one knows we've done it. Right? That the whole point is we're not acting in an open way. We're not acting with, with complete transparency. And the question, it seems to me, is given that so many of the things that are going on at OLC, in fact, won't see the light of day anytime soon. We won't have the kind of transparency of the front page of the Washington Post and the New York Times. Um, if we have reason, we being whatever, we're the president, we're advised to the president, reason to believe that this empirical claim, oh, your interest really isn't always going to be so perfectly aligned, what do we actually want uh, the advice to be to the president? And what advice do we actually give to the president if the president's you know, our friend? If in some context we think, you know, you can get away with this, and it's going to be politically beneficial to you to, to get away. It's not going to be politically beneficial for you to air this out to a lot of other people. Trust me, this will never see the light of day. Um, right? So I'm not, I'm, I, I, the, the point being that it seems to me in that situation, back to your good point, Walter, if you have somebody who has political heft in OLC, the political the, the right political answer really might be quite different from the right legal answer. I'm that, sorry, question mark. <laughs> I have to say, I really disagree that OLC's, um, OLC should as much as possible stay out of the public eye. I think that's, no, all right. I, I think, you know, in this context, Another question I had on my list, if we had time, uh, was going to be, should this opinion have been made public by the administration? Oh, you know, I'm in favor of before every, the, anyone knew, had any inkling I'm that in favor it had been Every written. government document being made public within five years, Supreme Court, everything, right? But this, that ain't going to happen, but sorry. Uh, I, I, you know, yeah. We try to make more things public, and I think that's a good test. And, and we, we did our memorandum on why the president, I've gotten you know, lots of criticism of the memorandum we did on the president's authority to send troops into Haiti. But we put it right out there, you know, as soon as the shooting stopped, and that's a good, a good check whenever possible. Why? What good reason is there for not, what good reason would there have been for not making this memorandum public? Obviously, one of the answers might be, well, it's a road map for people that want to torture our people, but that's an argument against the substance of it, I think. David, you have a. The argument was that, sorry, that the, the, you disclose to uh, people in Guantanamo and other places what the, what our limits were. Right. And then once they knew our investi and investigative and interrogative strategies, they then would be equipped ex ante to resist them. That's that's. I don't. Although it's a little hard to believe that people in Guantanamo would have the access to the internet to pull it up. Uh, <laughs> get a down there. Well, once they win the Supreme Court case, they get counsel. And we all the mouthpieces are just coming and they're giving them advice and, you know, they can't waterboard you anymore. So just, just hang on. You know, you don't have to disclose anything. I don't credit that. It's a, very, it's a very powerful argument, but that was the one advanced. I want to point out one thing on this transparency issue and then go to David. And that is, you know, when you have the Office of Legal Counsel saying the president uh, as commander in chief does not, um, is not bound by a federal statute. And that advice is given based on very much an independent view of uh, the Constitution that doesn't even cite still seizure case. Um, I think you know that that's um, another factor in favor of transparency. David, well, but, uh, don't yes. Just pick up, I'm just curious. It, it does seem to me that the administration might well have been under an obligation to notify Congress if, in fact. The president was going to authorize yes. engaging in torture, notwithstanding the law, because there is the statute, the rider, that requires notification where there's non-enforcement right. of a law. Right. Well, it did go on to form the basis of the DOD working group's uh, work and, and, and report, so it did have some effect. If they had just said, you know, this is ridiculous, this isn't what we asked for, this goes beyond what we imagine you'd be writing, and stuck it in a drawer, then, you know, fine, no obligation to make it public. David. What OLC should do to answer a question? I mean, it's not implausible, I think, for DOD to have some question about using harsh interrogation tactics. Um, 
persons being detained during the war on terror, it wouldn't have been impossible to ask it certainly as early on as they did. So there's going to be some sort of question we can imagine coming. And then when you think through answering one plus business, you answer it narrow, you know, defined circumstances. Um, I guess what I'm curious is what that opinion, what do you imagine the opinion is? Should it be oral or written? If it's written, are we going to do a construction of the Torture Act? Well, if we start construing the Torture Act, you run into some problem, and that's going to be inherently general. Right? It's going to be very hard to give a construction of the Torture Act that's not going to seem to have some generalizable characteristics over time. You're going to end up opining on the issue that Carlos averted to, which is, does the Torture Convention's prohibition against cruel and degrading treatment function as a prohibition? even though it's not been implemented in any statute. You're going to have the issue about specific intent and what that means. You might get into the issue of a defense and whether a defense is available under the statute. All of those seemingly narrow answers to a narrow circumstance are going to be generalizable just by the nature of the way our legal system works. And so I'm, I guess I'm wondering, what is a responsible way to proceed uh, in that circumstance? And then the, the second is just on the party affiliation and the hiring practices, which I think is a great question. Just what is the reason, if it's true what John suggested that over the last 20 years you see a difference, that basically the Republicans come in and it's all Republicans, the Democrats come in and eventually it's all Democrats, and the only part that's not is a certain segment of career lawyers who seem to last, but aren't really reflective of either party right. that exists right now. There's some nether world of people who can tolerate these two extremes. <laughs> happy under Reno, happy under Ashcroft, but the weird uh, thank God for them, but it's right. <laughs> so, but, and that seems different than the kind of what John was imagining of uh, OLC twenty years ago, which you could actually have Beth Nolan working in Ted Olson's uh, we had Cass Sunstein. Ben Nolan, Cass Sunstein, David Strauss, uh, the right. list goes on. Right. Maybe a little too much of a yeah. good thing. So, is, that a, <laughs> is that just the point about the legal culture post the board or something that that's... I think that's part of it. I, I, I think that, uh, that there's a long answer about the, about the division of the two parties into warring camps, starting with Congress, that there's, they've been ideologically We've ideologically purified the parties to such an extent that their party and ideology have go together more than they did 20 years ago. That's part of it. Part of it is understandable. I think when we uh, came into office in '93, it had been 20, 12 years since there had been a democratic administration. The people that wanted to be in government, it was such an enormous array of talent. You know, every great Stevens law clerk wanted to come into the government. You know, the the, the for all these years, so we, you know, the, our best resumes came from that. I mean, I, someone like Eric Poser said he would have stayed if he'd known I was going to be there. You know, I went, I went to people one by one, like Poser, and asked them to stay on for as long as they could. And, and then towards the latter part, when we, when we saw what was happening, I called Justice Scalia at one point and told him when he talked to his law clerks uh, or former law clerks and tell them that we'd be real interested that. Uh, in having some applications at OLC, so I, you know, I, um, I, I tried and do think it's important in, in, just to do better law, so that you get a different variety of, uh, you know, of of perspectives. But it um, it certainly has changed less so in the Solicitor General's office, um, but it's getting more. Democratic slash Republican there, I think, gradually than was the case. Is that right, Nina? Yeah, I think, I mean, it, I think it is less, uh, for some reason it retains, the, there's a longer time lag and the, and the evolution is slower and there's more of a mix. And I think in part that's because it's, um, it, it's work that has sort of an inherent attraction. It's very public, it's very glamorous. and. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what else accounts for it, but I, I, I wish the hell there'd been more Republicans during the Carter years than the. I mean, I, I, I think you can go, you know, too far to being an even-handed judge. Every time I would hear an opinion, 
that I thought completely wimped out on executive power. I would say, tell me the date. I know it's going to be between 1977, you know, and 1980. I mean, I was, uh, uh, you know, where was, we needed John McGinnis in there uh, uh, during those years, because I, I, I thought it was a too legislatively centered uh, period at OLC uh, in those, you know, in those years. So I think Randy wants to answer the first part. Yeah, Dan, I, I wanted to respond on that. I, I, first of all, I mean, with respect to written or not, I mean, I think if, if time permits, and even if time doesn't permit, I, after the fact that you do want to provide some written basis for your for your advice, and that it's important in, in forming part of the common law of the executive branch, and also to kind of put you to the task of actually going through the rigorous reasoning process of putting it on paper, when, when, where people's views can actually change and, and be refined. But also, I, I really do believe that there is you, you are right that any time you opine on a specific legal issue, that uh, general propositions of law um, can be inferred um, and that you need to address general propositions in, in doing so. But I, I do think there still is a big difference, particularly in the national security area, between simply opining in the abstract and opining with respect to a real issue that's in front of you. For, just for example, um, there's a big difference between Walter's opinion um, on Haiti and introducing troops in Haiti versus writing an opinion saying, you know, we live in a world in which the president has to commit troops overseas um, uh, on numerous occasions. This opinion addresses the question of when the president can, without express or direct authorization from Congress, commit troops overseas. If you're going to write that opinion, you're going to write an opinion that's a, a disaster mm -hmm. because you're either going to say, well, the president can do it whenever he wants, um, or you're not going to kind of actually think about some circumstance that is an important circumstance that just didn't occur to you and you're going to write something that it looks like you're foreclosing something you might not want to foreclose when it was really presented to you. I mean, if I may just come back, back to, to that, I mean, the way I would think of writing this opinion, a lot of what DOD's practices, what they wanted to do seemed to me pretty clearly not torture. If you had begun with, are these torture? I think you would have had to do, uh, you certainly wouldn't have had to have lines in the opinion that raised, I'm not saying that we're, even, we're not talking about whether they're correct or not, but it certainly raised a lot of problems that, you know, torture is, is nothing until you have some uh, damage to a bodily organ. But most of what DOD was talking about wasn't anywhere close to that. Now, there may be other instances where you may want to think about that, but then you can have some kind of predicate very carefully about, well, what happens if there is this nuclear bomb in the harbor, right? Try just to split out, up all the opinions, and I think that really would have a lot of difference both in the tone but also in some of the substance of the analysis. I think in the first case, you wouldn't have had to go into these defenses portion, which is what, what part, most, much of the most troubling part of the opinion. So I do think one, by framing this, could have, uh, could have largely um, uh, diffused much of the problems of the opinion. Michael had his hand up, if you still have a question or comment. Um, I'm going to pick up on something Walter said a minute ago, or actually several minutes ago, and, um, and maybe see if it's still pertinent. You had referred, Walter, earlier to something being right and having made mistakes. So how, what's the measure of rightness, and, and how are mistakes determined? What would the criteria be? And the second may or may not be related, and that is, do reversals of OLC opinions occur, and if so, how? Oh, uh, just the second part first. Uh, uh, I think Jeff, uh, maybe working with Neil, was the author of, uh, on the part of the Dellinger memo that talked about our adherence to stare decisis and that we thought there was a strong stare decisis tradition of OLC, prior OLC opinions. And you need a similar kind of reasons that a court would need. I think we were more serious about stare decisis than, than the court often is, uh, that, you know, it wasn't what I thought as a professor. Um, but it was, you know, we started with Jackson's opinion, et cetera, and, and went forward. So we do believe this is a strong tradition, and we, we had a whole series of reasons why we reversed at least the key TAM um, provision. How is something wrong? A um, couple of different ways. One is the um, health care task force decision turned out to be a train wreck, totally rejected by the D.C. Circuit. Our magazine was held in contempt. He had a million dollars in legal fees and gave a black eye to the lawlessness of the whole project. You know, that's a bad, 
that's not, in retrospect, good legal advice that gets you into that situation. And those are the way you've got to look at courts. And that wasn't OLC advice. It right? was not OLC advice, but I'm saying I know it, that, 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 that that's where it's got it wrong. Yeah. I think um, we were on the edge. One of the hardest questions was when we upheld striker replacement that the president could cut off federal contracting for any company that brought in replacements for strikers. We were very hemmed in there politically because the, our predecessors at OLC had allowed the president to use his contracting authority to require the posting of any union or you don't have to join a union signs by his contracting power. It was going to be very hard for us to roll back against that and say the president couldn't do this. It was one of the closest questions. And then in the Solicitor General's office, I refused to seek cert from our 3-0 defeat in the DC Circuit on that um, and went to the mat with the administration. It would be unwise to seek cert. So I think it was just a very close call. And that's one where we did have a lot of political pressure, but mainly from the fact of a pre-existing OLC opinion that I also thought was you know, was on the margin and very hard to tell them when that we were going to go back on what we were going to say. They couldn't do something they really wanted to do and overrule an OLC precedent to tell them no. That's really tough. That that was, you know, no was a, I was a no guy, but that was that was a, that was that was a little tough. Should we stop there? Yeah, we're out of time and want to thank Chris on behalf of all of yeah, us. Sure. Well, I thank you all for all the participation, both from the panelists and the audience. I am going to uh, transcribe these uh, proceedings into a written document, and we'll circulate them to the participants for corrections. And you can be looking forward to that. I also, as I was walking down here, looked out the window and saw a, um, a Subaru Outback with a kayak on the roof. So the rains are coming down hard. I hope that's not keeping people from uh, plane departures. but. Uh, We'll check on that for you, those folks who are getting to the airport. Uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much. I mean, the kayak was not supposed to be out there. If I said a kayak with a Subaru on it, I'd be very concerned with it. That may not be you. Oh, is y'all leaving? Are you leaving? I'm just sticking around. There's a tornado in the area. <laughs>